Uh, uh, Natalie, uh, Natalie is an associate professor of political science, and she's a director of Asian American Studies at Tufts University. Uh, her research specializes in American politics, uh, racial and ethnic politics, with a focus on political behavior, public opinion, and political psychology. Uh, her work pays attention to the ways uh, in which race, immigration, and identity influence political attitude formation among racial minorities. Uh, her first book, The Politics of Belonging, Race, Public Opinion, and Immigration, was the winner of the 2014 Ralph Bunch Award by the American Political Science Association. It's a very, that's, that's a very prestigious award. It's a good one. Uh, and it offered an analysis of public opinion differences on immigration across racial groups. Uh, other research by Professor Masuoka has been published in journals like American Politics Research, Perspective on Politics, uh, Political Research Quarterly, and the Social Science Quarterly. So welcome to the University of Wisconsin. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Ben. Um, I don't want to thank uh, the University of Wisconsin for the invitation. Uh, it's always a wonderful opportunity to uh, talk about uh, some of your research. Uh, this is actually even a uh, an even more ideal uh, opportunity because it's uh, kind of multiple takes here, uh, kind of forcing me to, to kind of think about different angles and, and how a different audience uh, would approach uh, some of the various different uh, iterations of my research. So I'm looking forward to the week uh, here. Um, today, uh, I am going to talk a little bit about uh, my new uh, research project. Uh, I've been working on this for a fairly long time. Um, Really, you know, I think, you know, just in terms of an overall research agenda is really kind of thinking about uh, racial formation in the United States uh, and really thinking about uh, more specifically how uh, different groups are interacting with one another, right, and, and the implications on politics. So uh, uh, one of the things that's really, I think, uh, has an interesting phenomenon that's come up uh, is the uh, growth of the uh, mixed race, or what I'm going to call today the multiracial population. Uh, and so we're going to talk a little bit about uh, really its um, role and, uh, you know, kind of why should we think about multiracial identities in American politics, right, so kind of what are the, the political implications of that, uh, and then I have a little bit of data to share uh, specifically about uh, Barack Obama, because he was an interesting case of um, kind of this, this idea of a mixed race identity, uh, albeit um, uh, kind of a unique one. So uh, usually, you know, when I start talking about uh, multiracial identities, you know, I, I, uh, I've realized that uh, I have a responsibility to also offer uh, an explanation of really kind of um, the uh, most important way of thinking about the significance of multiracial identities. Um, in political science, you know, we uh, emphasize uh, populations like African Americans, Latinos, uh, because when we talk about electoral politics, right, we're thinking about these voting blocks that are large enough to swing populations, right, in states. We just had an election, right, and talking about the Latino vote, uh, or the African American vote, right, or even the Asian American vote in uh, many West Coast areas. Um, and uh, so this, this really kind of um, is a, a very specific way that political scientists really talk about the significance of a minority population in the United States. Um, what I want to argue today uh, is that uh, while multiracial Americans consider themselves as a distinct population in the United States, uh, I'm going to argue today that we shouldn't actually use the same types of arguments about their significance as we do for black, Latino, and Asian American populations. This is a group that really at this point is, uh, constitutes about 4% of the population, so relative national population, uh, so that's relatively small. Um, and uh, so there's, this is not going to be necessarily a group where we're thinking about swinging an electoral, right, kind of a, an, an, an election, uh, because they, they're, they're large enough numbers, right, swinging one way or another. Um, so instead, you know, I, I want to uh, talk a, a little bit about um, some of the challenges to, to that idea. Um, and so I usually start off all, most of my talks really kind of talking about the common narratives that uh, for the last 10 years or so that I've studied this population, uh, tend to be evoked by the mainstream media. And the number one most often frame used to describe multiracial populations is this, you know, kind of, um, uh, you know, kind of amazing arrival of this brand new population in the United States. Uh, and this is an example of the type of framing that we would see about multiracial Americans. Uh, there, there was a New York Times um, series uh, in, or, you know, 2011, 2010, 
uh, that was highlighting, as you can see here, this is one of the articles, the multiracial population, uh, and talked about really this kind of amazing new population that's growing, <coughs> they have their own interests, right, they tend to be young, right, so kind of, you know, how, what, are, what, what do they believe, right, what, how do they go to school, how do they interact with others, um, and, this, and this type of frame tends to uh, explain mixed race Americans as this new population, right, something that we really haven't seen before, uh, but now we know that it exists, right, and so we should track it like we would uh, uh, any kind of other demographic population. Um, what I want to argue today is that this is actually, you know, I'm sure that this that folks, that folks in this audience would be attracted to this talk, uh, probably are not necessarily um, uh, surprised with this argument, but this is not necessarily, uh, I think, the most appropriate argument to think about mixed race in the United States. Uh, that in fact, historically, mixed race has existed in the United States since the colonial era. It doesn't only exist in the United States, it exists in other countries across the world, right? Um, this is an old um, uh, report from the census uh, that shows, right, a historic mixed race population, which is the mulatto category, which is the, you know, kind of, uh, what was used to describe half white and half black, or partially white and partially black uh, Americans. Uh, you know, you can see this is 1904, um, kind of, you know, this is a, you know, over 100 years ago, uh, even the federal government was talking about mixed race populations, right? So I think this idea that we tend to think about mixed race Americans as this new population is, is in many ways ahistoric, uh, right? The mainstream media, of course, you know, we can't always expect them to always get it right. Uh, uh, oftentimes they don't. Um, but I think it's a responsibility, right, as academics that we think uh, more in a more nuanced way about um, really uh, their significance, and it's not necessarily that they are a brand new population. Uh, but this doesn't, doesn't necessarily mean that this isn't a significant population, and so uh, in uh, um, the book that I've been working on, uh, I, wanted, I offer this concept of um, identity choice uh, as a way of thinking about mixed, uh, mixed race identities or multiracial identities. Um, that specifically, uh, mixed race Americans today really represent an important group because they uh, are evoking their race as a form of personal identification. Uh, and so it is in many ways this idea that this group, uh, they're trying to, to, to describe their preferred uh, racial identification that they want others to recognize them as, right? They don't want to be recognized as, 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 as either only white or only black, right, or only Latino. They want to be recognized as, as multiracial. They have different monikers for themselves, uh, like swirly, biracial. Uh, in the Asian American population, they use the word hapa, which is uh, kind of has its roots in Hawaii, um, kind of for, for kind of half, half foreign. Um, and so uh, the idea here is that uh, mixed race Americans today are really, I'm, arg I'm going to argue today, challenging our, the way in which we understand race. Uh, because what they are trying to articulate to us today is that we should think about race as a form of personal identification, or kind of a, a personal sense of self, which is a really, in many ways, a very distinct contrast to the historic practice of race, right, which is not necessarily kind of how you think about yourself, right, but really how you're treated by others. Uh, and so that contrast that mixed race Americans today show us, right, is a really important, I think, lesson about racial formation in the 21st century uh, that will then, I will argue uh, today, have a lot of consequences for how we use race in politics, in other, in other kind of uh, social phenomenon, um, uh, because uh, it's a very, very distinctive uh, uh, way of, of conceptualizing race. Uh, so this kind of, and so this kind of idea of identity choice. Um, so really, you know, what, where I wanted to start here was kind of thinking about this historically, which is really this contrast between what I'm really calling race as assignment, uh, which is when uh, your race was imposed on you by others, right? So you didn't necessarily choose uh, what you thought of yourself, but you were black because of existing social uh, norms and rules, right, that defined you as black or defined you as white. Uh, so that's what I mean by racial as assignment. Um, versus race as identity, right, which I argue today we're seeing more and more of, which is really how people think, want, to, want others to think about themselves, right? So it's, it's, a, it's a way of them uh, expressing uh, their sense of identity. And so I, I uh, wanted to contrast really these two concepts here because I think that this is a really important, especially when we think about politics, 
uh, an important shift here. So, you know, we've got this kind of racist assignment, which is kind of why is it that we had assignment uh, over time, right? Because by uh, assigning people into these racial categories, right, you could um, effectively implement and uphold various different uh, policies of racial discrimination, of racial segregation, right, uh, and various different types of racial treatment. So we see this from Jim Crow, right, which is kind of the importance of really classifying people into white versus black, or in this case, colored, right, and that determine in many ways different types of facilities that should be used, right, and kind of uphold help all of this idea of segregation. Uh, I found this poster, uh, this is a Harvard University student poster, which I thought really best captured this idea of, the, this modern idea of identity choice. This is a multiracial student group on campus. Um, and uh, you can see here that they have uh, all of the classic racial categories and ethnic categories, and they're struck out, right, very boldly struck out. And at the bottom it says, I am with the kind of figurative, you know, kind of blank space there where you are supposed to fill in your own racial category, right? So uh, this is really kind of a, a great demonstration here of this idea of identity choice, right, which is what's being articulated by multiracial Americans today, which is that you, right, you should be able to describe yourself. Uh, and so, of course, here, right, the, the, the kind of impact of these two images really give you a, a very competing sense here of uh, the narratives that exist. And so, you know, what I want to talk about today as well is, is uh, while we are seeing identity choice as a new development in 21st century race formation, uh, it doesn't mean that assignment has gone away, right? So what we now have is that really these very, uh, in many ways, um, coexisting and oftentimes competing narratives of on the one hand, we think about race as something that's assigned to you by others uh, outside of your control. Right? And on the other hand, we think about race as something that you uh, yourself have control over, right? you have agency about, uh, because you are trying to assert um, your racial identity. How is it that we get from this idea of thinking about race as assignment and transitioning into thinking about uh, an alternative way of defining race, which is race as identity? Um, one of the, the, the mechanisms for this transition, I'm going to argue, uh, is through uh, American institutions, political institutions, specifically the census. Um, and, and by uh, looking at the history of the census, uh, we can see and learn really how the federal government's portrayal of race <coughs> has allowed us to shift into this idea of, 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 of thinking about race as identification. Um, and so in political science, we kind of think about really kind of the kind of historical formation uh, of, a, of an institution like the census, right, and, and really what the uh, political implications are. So for the census, um, you know, the, of course, you know, the, there's, there's a little bit of background is, is, is always appropriate, but, you know, it's uh, uh, required by the Constitution, right, related to our representation. Uh, so we collect uh, data every 10 years uh, as a way of identifying uh, how many House of Representatives get assigned to each state, right? So this is kind of a, just kind of some, some, a little bit of background. Um, so every 10 years we enumerate Americans um, and uh, attributed to the three-fifths compromise, right, which is that three-fifths of slaves were counted uh, towards the population count in states, uh, the federal government had to count by race, right? They couldn't just count by count heads. They actually had to also differentiate if you're white or if you're black or actually also Native American because that was actually going to dictate how they calculated the formula for representation, right? So really since the founding, we, the, the federal government has implemented this racial classification in how they document the population of the United States, right? So one, kind of as a historical institutionalism uh, type of, of interpretation I'm offering, right, is that really deeply embedded in the Constitution is that the government uh, is responsible for thinking about how race is being represented, right, um, in, in not only in Congress, but right, but to others. Um, and so uh, the second point, of course, is that uh, the federal government has been in the business uh, of thinking about racial, racial classification, right, uh, since um, its first census in 1790. Um, and so, uh, kind of, you know, of course, we know when, when I talk about the census, I talk about kind of the kind of transition of the type of racial categories uh, that uh, are added on the census over time. But for my purposes today, uh, what I wanted to argue really is kind of thinking about this idea of, of assignment to identification, right? And one of the kind of interesting things about the way the census was collected 
is that up until 1960, uh, race was collected by the enumerator, right? So a government official, right, would go to each household, right, count the number of heads in that house, and also determine the race of each of those individuals in the household. Um, it was actually defined by the federal government what constituted black, white, et cetera, et cetera, right? And so here, I have here is a, a, this says instruction to the enumerators. And so it told you here who, what would actually count in a, for a person if they were to be counted as here, Negro, Mexican, other mixed races, et cetera. And so for example, it says a person of mixed, mixed white and Negro blood should be returned as Negro, no matter how small the percentage of Negro blood. Both black and mulatto persons are be, to be returned as Negro without distinction. A person of mixed Indian and Negro blood should be returned as a Negro unless the Indian blood predominates and a status as an Indian is generally accepted by the community. So that was the definition for how the enumerator was supposed to count uh, someone who was black. Um, I like the one for Mexican. So someone who was considered Mexican was practically all Mexican laborers are of racial mixture, difficult to classify, though usually well recognized in the localities where they are found. In order to obtain separate figures for this racial group, it has been decided that all persons born in Mexico or having parents born in Mexico who are definitely not white, Negro, Indian, Chinese, or Japanese should be returned as Mexican, right? So you can see here that the um, federal government really kind of thought about, right, kind of how the, this nuanced idea of approaching someone and thinking about really how they would be racially classified. But the idea here, right, is that the respondent wasn't telling, <coughs> telling the enumerator their race. Right? The enumerator and the federal government was actually looking at this person and assigning the race to that person. Right? This is a great example of really kind of how race has been practiced historically right, over time, um, which is that it wasn't necessarily your choice, right? but it was, def it was defined by others. Um, starting in 1960, uh, not necessarily attributed to, to a, an issue related to race, uh, more attributed to the, um, the issue related to the United States was getting uh, so populous um, and it was becoming too expensive to have enumerators go to every single household. They transitioned to the mail-in form. So this is now what we all know today, right? So every 10 years you get the form, it's, it, comes to your, it comes to your mailbox. Uh, you only see an enumerator, right, if you don't answer the form effectively, right? Uh, that's the only time the federal government will spend money on enumerators. Um, and so one of, I argue, an important shift here starting in the 1960s, and this is, of course, interestingly, it also shifts right around the time that we have the civil rights movement, right, and the, sh and the shift towards uh, civil rights uh, monitoring, is that now, instead of the enumerator uh, ex uh, filling out the race for you, you are given the form, right, and then you are answering the race question for the federal government. And this is an important shift in the modern era because this is now really how we tend to collect race, right? It's not as much uh, someone else giving the race for you, right? But you are asked in a mail-in form, in an application, right? In a telephone survey in which you're asked, uh, in, in which you're called, right? That you're asked to describe what you think you are, right? And so this is an interesting transition really in many ways a flat, you know, kind of uh, uh, primed here uh, for us to think about by the federal government, which is that you're supposed to be thinking about how you think about your race, right? Um, uh, and so I argue, you know, this is actually kind of important implications then for how people define what race means, right, and how you, how you account for race. Um, we're going to fast forward to the 2000 census, which is kind of even more so this kind of hyper-identification um, in, in terms of race. Uh, as a result of a social movement uh, organized by um, a group of um, uh, interracial uh, families and couple organizations, or various different types of uh, various different social groups that organize a social movement to lobby the federal government, uh, because they argued that their biracial children weren't actually allowed to really express themselves on the racial identification on the census, because as as as, we, as uh, ideally uh, as what we remember, right. Uh, historically, you, you're really only allowed to check one category uh, when you describe your race. You're only allowed to check white or black or, or Asian or et cetera, right? Uh, but these parents of biracial children wanted their, wanted their children to be able to say that they were both white and black, right? And so they wanted more identity choices uh, on the census. One of the things that the, that the, the Office of Management and Budget, who actually runs 
uh, the uh, decides what question, what uh, wording is used on the on the census. Uh, then decided is that they were going to allow even greater identity choices on the on the racial identification question. And so now we get to what we have today, which is now you're asked for your race, and you get to choose. Uh, to, uh, if you want to, you can choose to only mark one, right? Or you can mark more than one, uh, and as many as you think that you, uh, you want to describe um, how you think about your race, right? And so here is the start in 2000 census of the type of question that we see today, which is that you're given all these categories, right? And then you can either mark one or you mark multiple. Um, as attributed to this, right, this is why uh, really, in the last 10 or 15 years or so, is when we start really talking about multiracial identities, right? Because effectively, now, this is a group that really can exercise their identity and get recognized by the state, right? Uh, because now, uh, as attributed to representation on the census, right, this is now a group that can, rec that can be represented as a category, right? They're, they're documented as, as, as a, a demographic population. Uh, and so uh, th there is a correspondence here with the kind of rise in our media attention and social attention on multiracial identities, right, along with your ability to, to be recognized uh, by the federal government. Um, so what, there, there are a lot of things, I think, that um, I would argue as social science, scientists and actually just academics in general, uh, we should then be using this idea of assignment to identification and you know, what, what mixed multiracial identi uh, identities really force us to think about uh, in changing or at least questioning how we study race in the United States in the 21st century. Uh, and as a social scientist, you know, of course, the first thing uh, that I like to kind of raise is really the idea of kind of one, um, if we think about assignment versus of, of identification, this really then uh, really um, pushes scholars to think about how do we measure race, right? So how do we collect data on race today? Because there are so many different ways of defining uh, someone's race, right? You could do it by assignment, you could do it by identification. There's also all sorts of different ways that you can, that you can identify them. Um, and so as a, as a specialist in uh, survey data, right, what I argue uh, to the profession is, is that survey researchers, I think, need to be uh, more precise and I think, uh, you know, kind of uh, challenge themselves uh, to think about how they ask the race question and what specifically are they measuring when they choose the type of wording that they do. Um, in, you know, increasingly, uh, we are measuring race in survey design as uh, identity. Um, however, uh, it does exist still that uh, surveys today uh, and data collection procedures today do still uh, measure race as assignment. There are still many times uh, instances where you as a researcher are going into the field, right, and you are self-defining your population uh, for your study, right? And so that's, I would argue, is a great example of a study that is really adopting this idea of race as assignment, right? So this is kind of defined by the researcher. They're the ones that find the respondents, right? And then they are talking about the implications as a result of the assignment that they have given them. Um, in terms of, of survey research as well, this is actually when the interviewer is the one who, right, goes and assigns other uh, race to them. Now, of course, right, this type of design is incredibly expensive. It's very time consuming, right, uh, kind of outside of your dissertation. Uh, oftentimes, we don't have a lot of time to actually kind of go right into the field uh, and uh, really uh, do these kinds of face-to-face -face studies. So what's happening instead, right, is that we are trying to identify people by proxy, right, through um, uh, you know, kind of telephone survey, through, telepho uh, through uh, telephone interview, uh, through the internet, right? Uh, and in these cases, uh, when we do it that way, right, and then we are asking someone to identify themselves for you so that you can figure out if they belong in your study or not, right, that I would argue is an example of, ra uh, of, of, of conceptualizing race as identity. Um, in terms of survey research, I also argue that oftentimes social scientists uh, think about, when they think about measuring identity, they use questions that are kind of more specifically kind of identity centric, right, which is that uh, they ask questions like, the racial group that I belong to is an important reflection of who I am, right, so kind of, you know, this uh, to what extent someone's going to attach their personal identity with the group, 
or belonging to whatever X group is an important part of my self-image, or how close do you feel to your racial group, right? So the only time social scientists oftentimes think about race as identity uh, is kind of really kind of thinking about this process of the individual with the group, right? What I'm arguing today here is that even now just asking what is your race now is a form of identification, right? So the way today we are collecting race, this, that is not how people are being treated, okay? That, especially even on the census. This is how they think about themselves, right? So the results from your research, when it's based off a question like what is your race, that is how they are, that is a, a result of their identification. That is different than, say, for example, you're trying to understand kind of racial discrimination, perhaps, right, and the consequences, right, of being treated in a certain way. Uh, that necessarily is not always going to be perfectly uh, correlated uh, with what is your race, because oftentimes people have different senses of their identity, different from how they are treated. Um, and actually, a lot of the, the research actually does show that, uh, that in fact, um, when the researcher defines the, uh, the participant, your a study participant for you, their definition, right, and I think we, we, we probably wouldn't be surprised about this, their definition of someone's race is not the same as the individual's definition of the race, right? This is um, the general social science survey is a, is a main, main uh, kind of uh, uh, historic, it's been, been collected since I think the 1940s, 1950s, uh, used oftentimes in most social sciences, particularly sociology, We've collected kind of different measures of, of, of society across time. Uh, they did uh, really interesting studies in the 2000s uh, where they had the uh, interviewer uh, uh, document the person's race and then later had that same respondent say what race they were, right? And then they wanted to do an assessment about to what extent their race matched, right, what the uh, interviewer said it was, right? And in general, what's interesting here is that um, for whites, right, the correspondence here between how the interviewer would define what a person's, uh, if a person was white versus self-identification, that was pretty, uh, de de that was pretty close, right, although not necessarily quite uh, exact. Uh, where we start getting more fluidity is when we're looking not necessarily only at the black populations, but really those considered as other race, right? Uh, and other race, of course, are here are going to be Latino, uh, and, all, and, and uh, possibly Asian American, where uh, the interviewer and the uh, identification and self-identification really did not match uh, really uh, very closely at all. In fact, 81 uh, respondents, right, uh, the observation and the self-identity matched, were 63, right, so kind of almost the same number uh, had, a, had, had a no match, right, on, on their, um, on the two questions, right? So. Uh, this was really trying to push researchers to think about really, right, how it is that you are measuring race on your, on your survey. My own research, uh, where, where I'm trying to push people towards, is thinking about as well, when you give people the option to check only one box versus when you get to check multiple boxes, that that changes the demographics or the summary population of your uh, study. Right, and so uh, here is a study that uh, I was looking at uh, that was um, a survey in the 2000s. Uh, they actually uh, asked two versions of the question. So one, they asked respondents to give their race and they were only allowed to choose one race. And then later on, they, were at, they asked the respondents, do you think of yourself as mixed race? Um, and so you can see here, here's the population breakdown on the top. Uh, if the respondent only it got to answer uh, one race question, Latino in this case uh, was considered a race, so they were only they were, they were allowed uh, Latino as a contrast to white, black, Asian, uh, and other race, which is a little bit different than say the way the federal government collects it, which is by ethnicity. Uh, but we can see here that once you start uh, adding in this idea of if you consider yourself as mixed race, the total number of people who would be counted as white, right, black. Single race white, single race black, single race Asian, and Latino, which would be here, right, in, 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 in many ways shifts uh, from the population when we think about it as single race. Again, less variation here uh, amongst those who identify as white, right, and we see much more variation for those people who, at, at, uh, in the, on the original question, self identified as a single race minority, right? So the movement of the population really is being found amongst minority populations.
Okay, so when we're really thinking about defining these minority populations, the mixed race population is really altering how we would classify minorities, really who we consider a racial minority. Uh, this is something less impacting uh, the, the white population. I'm going to think about kind of historically, right, that um, in many ways, in some ways this makes sense given the way that whiteness has been defined, right, which is this idea of kind of being a, uh, a kind of racially pure race, right? So if you're white, you have kind of no evidence of uh, African ancestry, Latino ancestry, right, or, or Asian ancestry. Uh, and we can kind of see that those who identify as white, right, don't consider themselves uh, as racially hybrid, which is consistent with the historic understanding uh, of whiteness today. Um, one of the other things that uh, I do also raise uh, when we think about this idea of self-identification is that this is not something that only applies to people who self-identify as multiracial. Race as identity impacts all racial groups, right? Kind of the, 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 the tension between assignment identity, while at least so for uh, whites, it is still something that I think we should think about as applying to all racial groups, right? Not something that we think only applies to um, multiracial Americans. Uh, the most kind of interesting phenomenon of identity choice, so kind of the, the, the av availability to mark multiple races, uh, has uh, actually changed the uh, size of the American Indian and Alaska Native population um, at a pretty dramatic level over the last 20 years. Uh, that we can see here that uh, the count of those considered American Indian and Alaska Native, we've got that's the green bar, the green bars there. Uh, we can see here that you know they kind of grow uh, <coughs> somewhat steadily, consistent with the population. And then when they when you start to be uh, allowed to be able to mark multiple boxes, right, you see the 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 ginormous growth here of who is considered that American Indian and Alaska Native in 2010. That is higher than birth rates, right? So we can see here that increasingly who constitutes American Indian and Alaska Native really is an identity population, right? Um, uh, rather, so, rather than, uh, you know, I think what we think about is kind of, you know, tribal, you know, historic tribal, tribal recognition, recognition of happening. <coughs> the other uh, group that I would argue that we need to think about the tension between assignment versus identification uh, is uh, gender. Uh, so not only this is something that we think about in terms of race, but I think that, you know, especially with the rise of the transgender movement, uh, this idea of kind of assignment versus identification is something that we're increasingly seeing as relating to how people identify with their gender. Uh, where historically, right, we've thought about people being forced into male versus female, uh, but increasingly uh, uh, individuals want to be able to have more choices, right, in how they, in they identify. Um, now, we don't see this necessarily in federal forms, but, uh, for example, in university applications, uh, the University of California system a few years back now is allowing their new college applic applicants to identify as, the, you know, they, they can choose these kind of multiple gender categories, right? So we see this phenomenon of identification as a contrast to assignment, um, uh, even broader than race, uh, but also attached to identity. Uh, now, the, the real case that I uh, wanted to talk about uh, today was um, thinking then about um, this tension between assignment and identification. I think as a social scientist, what we start to realize here is that if those are really kind of two different processes, I think what's an interesting uh, question here is how is it do people assign race to others, right? And especially now with the growing number of, a, of people asserting a multiracial identity, right, is this kind of creating uh, a more complex way in which people are choosing to assign race to others, right, how they racially classify others. Um, so one, you know, I think this idea of assignment in contrast to someone saying, you know, um, you know, don't classify me as, as, as black, right? I really feel like I'm multiracial, right? That kind of interaction we now have more often, uh, I would argue, right? And so my question here was kind of, you know, having those interactions where people are trying to correct you with their identity, uh, I'm, I'm wondering, right, uh, kind of what, what are we seeing here um, uh, in recent years about how people process and classify others? The other thing, too, is I wonder to what extent we all racially classify in the same manner, right? So to what extent we all kind of see race in the same way, and uh, you know, are the implications of doing that uh, the same regardless uh, you know, of your education, your race, your gender, et cetera. 
So I did want, I was thinking about kind of how this varies across the population. Uh, the political scientists, of course, our case in point uh, was Barack Obama. So, you know, studying multiracial identities and then Barack Obama runs for office. Uh, he very much highlighted his mixed race background. You know, we all know the story, right? His mother's from Kansas. He was very, very, he was, he was, he was raised by his white grandparents, you know, in Hawaii. He has an Indonesian stepfather, right? So he really highlighted this idea of you know, this interracial family. Um, and so he presented this message to Americans, right, as this is what his background was. Um, he's a unique case of multiracialism, however, that his message to Americans was that he was of interracial background. However, his official identification was that he was black. Uh, he was very um, firm about this when asked in 2008 when he was running for president about how he identified himself. He talked about why he identifies himself as African American because he had that kind of famous kind of taxi story about, you know, if I'm hailing a cab, right, in New York, right, people think I'm black, right, so they don't think that I'm mixed race or something else, right. So he told, he told that story very often when he was running for president. Um, and then when he was in office, we had the 20 cent census. Right, and so he, you know, they publicized how he chose to identify himself, and he checked only black as his race. Right, he didn't check multiple boxes, and that was something that uh, even made the New York Times uh, about the race that he chose. So I argue that Barack Obama really actually presents kind of this interesting, contrasting pieces of information to Americans. So I was kind of wondering here, right? How is it then, given the different uh, messages about his race, he was giving to Americans? How is it that Americans saw his race? Uh, and so I had a, um, a new survey measure added to the American National Election Survey, which is the political scientist survey that we, uh, we collect every, every presidential election, but also every midterm election. It allows us to kind of get a sense, right, of, of uh, what's going on in politics, uh, ideally. Um, in uh, 2010 and 2012, so kind of right before his second, uh, his re-election, the second campaign, uh, they were given this survey, and so I had um, the uh, co-PIs add this question, which is, how would you describe Barack Obama's race? Um, the co-PIs wanted to put Mark the Elder that applied to be consistent with the way that the census is being measured today, since you can check multiple races. And then we gave them a whole bunch, we gave respondents a whole bunch of racial categories uh, to answer. So they could check one, they could check all. Uh, we also added mixed race in there just to see what people would say. Um, and so the first thing here, I'm going to skip that slide. The first thing here, of course, is then how did people answer this question? Uh, and I was very surprised uh, with the amount of variation in uh, how Americans chose to answer this question. Um, so one of the cool things about this survey was that uh, there were substantial numbers of blacks and Latinos that I could think, you know, analyze blacks and Latinos as a separate population from whites. This is kind of consistent with kind of some of my suspicions that we might not all racially classify in the same manner, right? So I was wondering if black Americans saw Barack Obama's race, right, as, as, as uh, white Americans did. Um, and in general here, we can see, so what I did here is I uh, clustered them. So if a respondent only said one race, uh, that's the first four, right? And how many, what percent of, the, of, this, of whites, blacks, and Latinos said, for example, he was only black. Uh, the next set are people who chose two races, and then what were the two races that they chose? And then the last cluster there are people that selected more than two races. Um, and we can see, interesting, there's a lot of whites, right? So we can really see the variation. But really, amongst whites, blacks, and Latinos, uh, there was a lot of variation in the types of combinations people were choosing to describe uh, Barack Obama, right? Only one person in that entire sample said that he was white, uh, which is, I think, you know, kind of a, a consistent here with some of the previous uh, slides that I had about kind of how we define whiteness. Um, the other interesting thing here is that uh, most Americans uh, describe Barack Obama's race as mixed race. Okay, so even though Barack Obama himself said that he identifies as black, right, um, uh, the plurality of Americans said uh, that he was mixed race. However, this did vary by race respondent. Uh, white Americans were the most, the largest proportion of white Americans were, were likely to say he was mixed race, either in terms of actually saying he was mixed race or marking multiple boxes to designate that he was mixed race, right? Um, Latinos were next, 
they had the next uh, uh, share, uh, largest share proportion that said it was mixed race. And African Americans had the smallest share, right? So African Americans were most more likely than uh, whites or Latinos to say uh, Barack Obama was only black, right? So uh, consistent with my expectations, uh, we did see differences um, for, um, by race in racial classification. Now, um, I, I, of course, you know, as, as uh, 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 someone who also studies Asian American politics, uh, unfortunately, a lot of these surveys don't often give you samples for Asian Americans for us to actually have legitimate or reliable samples of it. Uh, I had, there was another study on only Asian American voters that was also conducted in 2012. Uh, I, I, I don't really have access to this data, but I at least was able to get a question on the survey and just see how Asian Americans answered this question. Uh, so I just wanted to kind of give this for comparison, but we aren't going to be looking at Asian Americans today because that wasn't, unfortunately, that's not, an, uh, not, was not available for me to analyze the data. Uh, but effectively, um, Asian Americans here, I'm sorry, that's actually not very easy to see on this projector. 34.4% uh, said black, only black, uh, 46 said mixed race, and then uh, the rest of these are other race or do not know. So they didn't get the multiple box option. But effectively here again, uh, kind of consistent with uh, other Americans, Asian Americans also are more likely to say uh, he, Barack Obama's mixed race than anything else. Uh, but uh, a good number, uh, you know, over, slightly over a third of Asian American, at least voters, uh, said that he was black, right? So um, Asian Americans also have their own pattern uh, in thinking about race. And so, uh, you know, kind of, uh, one of the questions that I had was not only, uh, you know, kind of how do people assign race, but were there implications to seeing Barack Obama as mixed race versus black, right? So my question, of course, was, uh, was really, you know, did this affect voting behavior, right? So the fact that he uh, was seen by some as mixed race, were they more uh, supportive of the president, right? Or were they more um, discriminatory, right? Did they have kind of more uh, racial resentment uh, or kind of, you know, kind of racial stereotyping of the president uh, because they, they saw him as one way or the other? Um, and so uh, what I wanted to do is look at different um, evaluation items of the president. Two are what in political science we consider kind of classic evaluation items, which we call the feeling thermometer, so kind of how warm or cold do you feel to this president, just kind of this idea of kind of affect. Uh, and then how uh, much do you approve of the way Obama is handling his uh, job as president. So one, I wanted to see just generally kind of evaluations of the president. But also, especially since this is about his race, um, is uh, our respondents more likely to racialize the president? Um, and so, you know, the question is, for especially uh, those that see him as more traditionally a racial minority, specifically as black, right, are they more likely to assign these kind of racializing stereotypes towards him compared to um, respondents who identified him as mixed race, right? So there are a couple of questions on the survey that kind of allow me to get to this idea of racialization. One was, is I, the, was the incorrect assumption that Obama was Muslim, right? So kind of to what extent they're incorrectly assigning um, the, what, what is often seen as, as pejor a pejorative or, or an undesirable uh, religion. Um, and then the, the degree to which the respondent thought the Obama paid too much attention to race in general when he made his federal appointments, right? So kind of, was he kind of overly um, uh, prioritizing his own, his own group? And so just on the basic, these are, so these are kind of average scores on a scale of zero to one. And you can see here that in my last slide, um, I have kind of one being, you know, kind of uh, very warm job approval, and then uh, those people that are more likely to stereotype Barack Obama. Um, and so uh, I broke down here our uh, respondents into whites, blacks, and Latinos. Uh, and then within each racial group were whites who identified Obama as black, right? Whites who identified Barack Obama as mixed race or, or you know, kind of the multiple, multiple box option. Uh, and I compared their scores, right? So I took the average score of each of these groups and we compared them. So here you can see the feeling thermometer and job approval as our first ones. Uh, and, uh, well, you can see here that there are differences. That in fact here for whites, right, those whites that saw Barack Obama as mixed race had higher feeling thermometer and job approval um, of him. Uh, there is, those aren't statistically significant, right? So from a statistician's point of view, we kind of consider that as kind of no, no effect. 
Um, however, for blacks, those blacks that saw Barack Obama as, as, as also as black gave him a higher feeling thermometer. That was statistically significantly different than blacks who saw Obama, Barack Obama as mixed race. We only saw, I only saw a significant finding there for the feeling thermometer, nothing for job approval. Uh, for Latinos, interestingly, they also gave higher feeling thermometer uh, ratings for, uh, and job approval ratings for Obama's black, right? But those actually are not statistically significant. Uh, when it came to the racialization questions, uh, for whites, whites who saw Barack Obama's black were more likely to say he was Muslim uh, than whites who saw him as mixed race. Um, there was no effects here for on the racialization for, for black respondents or Latino respondents, right? So there was, we didn't find, I didn't find a racialization effect. Um, the question, of course, that I always get uh, when I uh, do this kind of stuff, right, is particularly focusing here on white Americans, was is there a fact whether or not the person was Republican or Democrat, right? Because Republican and Democrats had different ideas of whether or not he was Muslim or not, and et cetera, right? And so uh, my last set of slides here are just focusing on, on whites only and disaggregating them by uh, their, their party ID. So the red bars here are, so instead of the, just the regular means, I'm going to give you bars to kind of make it a little bit more uh, visual here on the differences. The red bars are white Republicans, uh, and then, of course, Republicans who see him as black versus mixed race. Uh, the gray bars are independents, and the blue bars are Democrats. Uh, and you can see here, right, that in general, consistent with what we would expect, Democrats give Barack Obama a higher feeling thermometer than Republicans, right? Their scores are bigger. But what's interesting here is that Democrats, the effect of seeing Barack Obama as black had actually a significant effect for white Democrats, where we did not actually see an effect for uh, white Republicans or white independents. Where black, white Democrats who saw Obama as mixed race actually gave him a higher feeling thermometer than white Democrats who saw him as black. Uh, that effect was the same for the other evaluation measure on job approval. Uh, we found no effects for Republicans, no effects for independents. However, white Democrats who saw Barack Obama as mixed race were more likely to give him a higher feeling, uh, a job approval rating uh, than uh, Democrats who saw him as black. Uh, the, 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 the results actually flipped um, when we talked about the racialization measures, where when it came to racial, racializing Barack Obama, uh, the main effects are for Republicans. Where Republicans who saw Barack Obama as black were more likely to say that he was Muslim right, than those who were uh, uh, likely to, who saw him as mixed race. Uh, and the same thing goes for whites that pay too much, uh, who believe that they, uh, Obama pays too much attention to race and gender. Um, Republicans who saw him as black thought he paid too much attention to race and gender uh, compared to mixed race. Uh, and so interesting, you know, when we start breaking down, even by partisanship, we see some of these interesting effects. Uh, really demonstrating here, you know, the uh, kind of persistence here of assignment um, in contrast to identification, right, and the political implications, right, of doing that. And you kind of think about then about, you know, kind of the uh, Obama's uh, campaign strategy of kind of trying to use this, like, his family narrative of mixed race, right, kind of, you know, the, the effects in many ways, I'm sure, uh, were something that they were thinking about in terms of kind of think of, of you know, how, is, how they were actually going to frame his race towards, to, particularly to white Americans, but also to, to black and Latino Americans. Um, so, so that was my last slide, and so I, I really just wanted to end uh, emphasizing this idea of um, thinking about the significance of multiracial identification uh, as introducing this tension between assignment and identification. Um, and multiracial Americans really think, make forces to think about how we can study race's identity. Um, uh, you know, but of course, uh, just because we now have this new uh, concept uh, or kind of uh, definition of race's identity, uh, we, we see, as with the case with Obama, right, that uh, assignment still is a, is a very important uh, type of phenomenon that, that uh, uh, we need to study uh, as social scientists. Uh, and so I'll, I'll end there. All right. Oh, we're ready for questions. Okay, <laughs> go ahead, Patrick. I think this was fantastic. Oh, thank you. Really fascinating. Um, so I've got a bunch of things, and I don't want to take up too much time um, by monopolizing. Yeah. Um, so one of them is, 
To, and maybe I'll just rattle off some things. And you okay, can pick sure, you. yeah. To what degree is one's identity dependent upon assignment or classification by others? I mean, yes. if we lived in some alternative counterfactual world mm -hmm. where there was nobody to, you know, no history of racial categorization, mm -hmm. would we have it any? I mean, would be, you know, I mean, and nobody's coming up, this, or a few people would come up with some, like, really outlandish right. identification. Right, um, right. So there's a sort of dialectic there. And, yes. Um, I, and then you asked, at one point you, in your thing, you said, how close do you feel to your racial group? And right before you put that slide up, I was thinking to myself, how many people are resistant to identifying themselves racially? So you had, in a later slide, Gender non-conforming. I'm just mm -hmm. thinking about race, race non-conforming. Oh, mm -hmm. um, and then there's the, the another thing came to mind, which was thanks to a resident that been invited long ago, who had some survey data on Dominicans in the Dominican Republic, uh -huh. um, who, who almost none of whom identified as black, but identified as Indian. Uh, and there's no very very little indigenous population left in the Dominican Republic, and yet there's a, long, a large Afro-descendant population. Mm -hmm. So there's, you know, that's an interesting phenomenon right there. Mm -hmm. But it, then it's the other thing that I was thinking about before you even brought up Obama was, some people who are mixed race um, and acknowledge that they're mixed race mm -hmm. will identify as one thing. Right. So, for example, we had a visitor here some years ago who said, I'm part indigenous, I'm part white, I'm part Af African, but I identify as black. Mm -hmm. And his explanation for that was that it was, you know, it, it's the kind of, he's a very political person, it's the kind of work he does, and it made me think too about Obama that, you know, he famously has struggled with his identity, yes. right? Yes. And so what degree has his political career influenced his eventual mm -hmm. identification uh -huh. as black. In fact, you know, his famous decision to move to the south side of Chicago and, mm -hmm. you know, sort of mm -hmm. establish his black bona fides. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And to what, and then it was also well known that prior to his run, or early in his run for um, president, when he was testing the waters, a lot of black people were like, he's not black. Right, right. Right. Um, but then once he was a viable candidate, and especially after he got elected, he's one of us. Yes. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. uh, you know, so there's a mix of things. Yes, yeah. Um, uh, they, I, think, I, think, I think my answer could hopefully, hopefully address uh, a lot of these questions. But I'll start with the first one, which is um, uh, so some of the readings that I have for the seminar uh, address, I think, that first question, which is, uh, the, the idea here is that, you know, um, a lot of times uh, the way that people identify, right, uh, is influenced by, uh, many times, their external, for, the external kind of forces out, outside of them. Um, sociologists have been, uh, I think, a little better than political scientists about addressing this. Uh, so a lot of the work uh, that I would be citing uh, comes out of sociology. Um, but uh, phenotype, uh, we realize, actually really does still play a really important role in individuals feeling that there's an opportunity for them to say that they're mixed race. Uh, and so, you know, kind of li having lighter, you know, so a lot of individuals who have lighter skin or they look more ambiguous, uh, they are really open about the fact that interactions, because they look ambiguous, allow them for that opportunity to say that they're, that they're mixed race. Whereas those who are, in fact, they do have appearance of two different races, but don't necessarily but look more prototypically, say, black or Asian, uh, don't have that same opportunity. Um, and so oftentimes, you know, we, um, you know, th this is kind of my intervention here into some of the literature, which is that, you know, we can think about a population that really is uh, self-identifying, uh, you know, as multiracial, and we should kind of work backwards then, right, about kind of then, uh, if this is about identity and not something that is kind of just an, an obvious or inherent um, automatic classification. Because oftentimes what a lot of people will do will say like, well, you know, your parents, your, your mom's white, your dad's uh, Asian, so of course you're multiracial, right? And, and, and people tend to do that. They kind of just automatically only associate it with the parents or being a child of an interracial couple, right? 
Um, and um, I think that's, a, 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 on a scholarly level, we're increasingly realizing that that's a mistake, right? Because uh, there are all of these different processes that are leading someone to either be treated as such or, or self-identify as such. Uh, and so I'm trying to encourage social scientists to not automatically give a definition of multiracial to people, right? That we should really kind of think about. Some of the people are kind of identifying as such, and so then we should think about, right, what factors uh, are, are that. And um, there's a lot of interesting work about, you know, kind of the ability, the opportunity for, um, in sociology, opportunity to kind of identify the, like, a lot of identity switching which is very common for people who, who self-identify as mixed race, that they will switch between, in some contexts, they'll say that, that they're mixed race, but in other times they'll say that they're white, if they kind of deem it uh, uh, more advantageous or kind of more appropriate. Um, you know, and the, the real emphasis then on context, uh, you know, which is, a, a, of course, a very important uh, um, uh, way of, of defining race, right? This kind of contextualization. Right, and if um, I can interrupt, just the, the case, as I'm remembering, the case of the Dominican Republic, <coughs> their explanation why, as to why, or the hypothesis as to why people would reject identifying themselves as black was they didn't want to be thought of as Haitian. Yes, right, 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 right. Um, so they're kind of reading the politics of their context, right? And that's, all, that's influencing it. One of the most important, I think, things uh, to know about the patterns of multiracial identification in, in, to a more racist population is that um, it's not uh, equi the uh, identification is not equitable across the United States. Uh, that it's the lowest in the South, right, uh, but highest uh, in the West, right. And so, uh, you know, if 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 context didn't matter, right, ideally we should see. That kind of you know, generally speaking, we should see um, kind of uh, kind of equitable numbers of multiracial identification across the board, but we don't. Um, you know, it is in many ways all of the data is pointing to kind of how context specific it is, and that's informing this concept of identity, right? That it's that it's um, it's a formation of someone interpreting uh, who they are kind of relative to others, um, which is really important. Um, uh, I want to kind of pick up on the Barack Obama uh, comment, and then I know you have a question. Um, uh, you know, kind of Barack Obama, uh, I think, is an is an interesting case of also this someone who was, um, and I've, I've talked to him about uh, a lot of to him uh, his case to a lot of various different black politics scholars, African American speci uh, politics specialists, uh, and they've uh, really emphasized to me the um, strategic way in which Barack Obama went to black audiences and emphasized only his blackness. Uh, and so again, this is kind of an interesting kind of strategic move on his part. Uh, yes, uh, that when he was in black, so then they were saying, well, I'm not, I, they were arguing to me, it's not just because blacks see race differently. They were talking to me about, you know, blacks actually heard a different message than white Americans and Latino Americans. Because when they were in an all black audience, Barack Obama had a whole different narrative about his race than what he was giving to, to white Americans. Uh, and so I thought that was, a, that was a really interesting point that I really had to kind of grapple with. It's related to kind of your question about this kind of idea of you know, people choosing these different types of identities depending on their context. Um, you know, but um, I, I, I've had a lot of debates uh, with, you know, kind of, do blacks really see race differently, right? Or it, with the messages of political leaders like Barack Obama, who I study, right, um, that are emphasizing multiracial identity identities and single race identities, it's because the messages are different, right? Um, and, it, and it seems to me a lot of the scholars think that the messages are different, not necessarily that we see race differently. Um, which is really kind of interesting. Yes, you have a question. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I was thinking the same thing. I'm glad to hear you talking about the reality that multiracial people just identify as more than one thing in every different situation. Yes. Because it's hard to say, you know, this is how they identify. It just yeah. means that's how they answer the question in that moment on mm -hmm. that survey. Um, because when I was looking at those questions of how they identify, I was like, well, the most obvious question is what were the other questions on the survey? True. Because that's how multiracial people choose what to identify as mm -hmm. because they realize that there's a problem with multiracial people being double counted or undercounted mm -hmm. and if it's advantageous for to, you know, identify as one thing or another. Those are all things that people take into consideration when choosing like a which box to mark. Mm -hmm. So I feel like the context for the surveys is important in making sense of 
which identify an identity seems to be the one that a mixed race person is claiming in that moment, this like fleeting moment. Um, but I also have a, like a bigger question about this concept of identification versus assignment, which is just how how is it that mixed race people are the ones who seem exemplary in this? Because isn't all having all the history of all like African American, Asian American, Chicano, Latinx, all of these groups mm -hmm. are identification, mm -hmm. right? So mm -hmm. what is it that's mm -hmm. different about mixed race people that makes it seem like I, uh, racial identities haven't always been premised right. on self self-determination and people's own understanding of whether or not they want to identify with that category? Right, right, that, that is, that is uh, I think that's a really important point you're making. Um, you know, historically, uh, I think that you're absolutely right uh, that um, uh, it, this is not the only group, right? And that's quite why I wanted to talk about kind of American Indians, right? That there's that this concept of, of identity assertion is something that Black Americans are doing, Asian Americans are doing, Latino Americans are doing. You even use you even use the term Latin, Latinx, right? Which is this kind of shifting in even how uh, you're describing your identity terms. Um, I argue that uh, really. Uh, multiracial Americans, I think, are the best way of uh, getting an audience to realize, right, that increasingly Americans are, are defining race as identity. I think you can use African Americans and you can use Asian Americans or Latino Americans to talk about that, uh, but it gets muddied, right, I think, uh, just in terms of Kind of rhetorically, or you know, kind of when you when you're kind of when you're trying to make an argument about this, because there is the history of assignment, right, which is something that has characterized the formation of Asian American, Black, and uh, many types of Latino uh, identities. Uh, you know, before the 1960s, really, um, I think this idea of identity really didn't exist, right. So uh, African Americans weren't black because they wanted to be black, right? They were classified as slaves or classified as second class citizens uh, by outside social forces that then led them later to embrace that identity and, and, and learn how to deal with it, right? Did dem, you know, kind of cultivate different strategies about how to deal with that identity. So the identity was, a res prior to 65, the identity was really a response to their, their assignment. Um, what I argue today is that kind of really as, a, as an attribute of shifts made in the 1960s, not just by the census, but also by various different types of uh, outcomes related to the civil rights movement, um, we are increasingly tr starting to see uh, that shift towards people thinking about their race as something that they really want to express as a personal form, right? It's kind of, you know, for blacks, this idea of blacks is black is beautiful, right? Which is this idea of kind of really trying to take control over what blackness means. Those were all messages that happened really, uh, uh, really, you know, kind of after, after the civil rights movement. Um, and so, you know, we, but we see really for the first time the creation or the assertion of mixed race identities kind of come up during that time Right, kind of an attribute of, of that culture, and so I, I, I would argue that it's it's more of a fact of kind of you know allowing us to more easily see it using multiracial identities. But I agree with you that, that they are not necessarily the only ones, the only ones doing it. Yes. Uh -huh. Our adoptees, Korean adoptees, Chinese adoptees, black kids who are adopted by white mm -hmm. parents, is that the parallel predicament uh, with multiracials? And speaking in terms of electoral behavior. Yeah. If you have a situation where it becomes a very uh, salient mm -hmm. matter and people are, are going to vote in terms of a kind of mixed identity, would adoptees have a coalition point mm -hmm. with multiracials? Yes. Um, so um, uh, I've, I've been studying the activists for, for quite a long time. Uh, and the activists who originally started off as um, interracial couples and interracial families primarily white black families uh, that were articulating a need for multiracial, uh, for multiracial identification. Um, over the last, uh, since after, after the census change, uh, so since about 2000 through about today, now consider um, transracial adoption as part of their coalition. Uh, so they do see it, so on the activist level, now I'm not necessarily saying at the, at the everyday citizen level that they see themselves as, as, as aligned, but at the activist level, 
um, they are trying to advocate for what they consider uh, multiracial, interracial, and transracial as they see it, because they see it as, and they articulate to me as a very similar, as you're saying, a very similar set of challenges related to identity, parents, choices, uh, et cetera. Uh, and so they see themselves as aligned um, in terms of political interests uh, and, and who, who, what kind of protections need to be made. Um, however, I have not yet seen a study, I don't study transracial adoptions, uh, so I, I'm less um, aware of what the position is on that. I'm not sure exactly at the regular citizen level to what extent transracial adoptees think of themselves as having the same set of issues as the multiracial um, activist movement. I would say I could see the similarities, but then you know it, that's a, that's a whole other you know can of worms uh, that um, you know you would open about identity uh, that's different about, about transracial. But but I will say at the activist level they consider them uh, highly aligned. Yeah. Yes. Um, so I was interested in the poster set up this theme of I am. Yes. But I'm just wondering, you know, and I think it's great that you're, you're calling attention to the context, the shifting context. Mm -hmm. So is the political climate or, you know, wartime, like, you know, during World War II, except um, Chinese Americans, <coughs> Americans wore badges, like, I am not. Yes. I am not. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, Japanese. And so now, in a way, with the different climate also shifting, it may be that we will have people saying, I am not Muslim, I am not um, you know, a Middle Eastern. Right, right, right. right. So, so <coughs> you know, you haven't really talked about what I am not. The true identity is choosing something, mm -hmm. but there is a sense that, um, you know, some people may just want to choose what I am not. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. in certain instances, and not claim who they are. Right, 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 right. I mean, that's outside I, the census, right? Yeah, no, uh, yeah. I mean, I actually uh, that that uh, that's actually never. Uh, you're absolutely right. It, that's actually never been posed to me before as an important contrast to identity formation, because you're right. That is actually a historic uh, exercise that different groups have made over time. Um, uh, I, I've actually never thought about it that way. I mean, you, you've you, you're, you've stumped me a little bit. Um, um, but but that's, that is a great point about kind of thinking about then how that adds into this idea of identification versus assignment. Because in many ways, that's a really important uh, response to assignment, I guess. Yeah. Um, uh, yet still an evoke, uh, you're still evoking an identity. Yeah, that's a great point. Um, uh, I will definitely think about that one and kind of think about how I can integrate that that concept, because that's a good point about uh, how that helps my um, framework here. Thank you. Yes. Yes. I find myself wondering about Latinos, Hispanics, and how they perceive themselves in terms of some of the categories. Yeah. <laughs> you're talking about because there's always this little asterisk when you read you know, data yes. broken down according to race or ethnicity. Says Hispanics can be either can be of any race, or can be yes. either black or white. Yes. How do they view this, this, this kind of distinction? Yes, that's a great question. So uh, what your point being is, is particularly for federal, any kind of federal reporting, uh, the, the federal government says that uh, Latino is actually not a race. So you ask a Latino question, are you Latino, yes or no? Right? And then you get asked, what is your race? Right? And so this is what you meant about Latinos can be in any race. Because you can say, yes, I'm a Latino, and then you're still going to answer the question, am I white, black? Etc. Right. Um, uh, for Latinos, I mean, you know, you know the, the historic Latino literature, of course, would would say that uh, you know there is a, a this kind of concept of mestizo, right, which is a, a, a very historic concept, concept defining uh, what makes someone Latino, which is kind of the mixture, right, the admixture that you see um, in Latin America, um, is an impor important historical intervention for me. Um, uh, but in terms of data, um, Latinos are, um, they, they have very specific patterns in how they answer that question. Uh, historically, it's been a split between Latinos who self-identify as white versus other race. Uh, 
And uh, a lot of the research has shown that Latinos who say that they're other race kind of think of themselves, Latinos as kind of this mestizo race, right, kind of this unique race. Now that there's a two or more races category, Latinos can actually designate their, their, their themselves as, as mixed race, right? Um, the same way as Americans. And Latinos uh, have a rate of, um, I think it was, it's 8%. Um, the highest percentage you see are amongst uh, American Indian, uh, Alaska Natives, right? Because you see a lot of people there checking white and American Indian. Um, Asian Americans are next. Uh, they're in the double digits. Uh, and then Latinos are after that, and they're, they're, I think they're about 8%. Um, so interestingly, um, you know, kind of Latinos uh, and this kind of idea of mestizo, uh, it's even in many ways complicating how they describe that because there are still a, a large number of Latinos that check other race. But then there is an 8% of the population now that is checking two or more races. So now you kind of can see this kind of, in many ways, kind of uh, not bifurcation, bifurcation, but in, in this kind of uh, splitting of Latinos and how they're trying to describe this kind of mixed raceness. Uh, about them, um, and this two or more racist category is kind of is, is complicating how they would describe that to the, to to us uh, in terms of data collection, even more so than it was before. Um, but but they they are they do have higher rates of saying that they are two or more racist than whites and blacks. Uh, Simply, the, are, are the significant percentage that check Hispanic and black, or Hispanic and white. No, so what they what you would do is they, they would say yes, they're Hispanic, and if they're two or more races, they're going to check white and black, or they're going to check white and uh, other race, uh, so that you can they can only kind of check the the ones that are, are considered racial boxes. Like this one. Um, oops. Oh, I lost it. Um, there you go. So this question here. These are the only categories that you get on um, for for race. Uh, so white, black, American Indian, uh, Asian, which is designated by various different uh, national origins and then some other race. So if you're a Latino, you would say yes, I'm Latino, and then you can say I'm kind of white and black, or white and uh, Asian Indian, white and American Indian. Um, and so eight, about eight percent of Latinos are saying that. And then another very large share are just saying only one race and they're just checking some other race. And they're writing in Latino or they're writing in Mestizo. Um, and so I don't think that this question is changing how Latinos think about their mixed raceness, but it's changing how they are communicating that to us. I actually don't know uh, if the Latino who's checking multiple boxes is conceives of their identity any more or less differently than a Latino that says that they're other race and they say they must do so. That's actually an interesting social science question, actually, to, to ask. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, actually, you were going precisely where I was hoping you would. Yeah. Um, uh, it seems to me that, uh, uh, that if you give Latinos the opportunity to check more than one race, uh, one, uh, um, you could just open up the floodgates. I mean, they, yes. they could just, you know, yes. you know, just all of a sudden the mixed race category is right. huge now. I mean, it's not just. 4% of the population, mm -hmm. but, but there are millions and millions of people who right. say that. Uh, but socially, that's not the life that they need, and I wonder if it, if it doesn't just sort of serve as a warning uh, that survey research doesn't always capture. Uh, as much as what I think is implied in your talk here, that uh, you seem to imply that it really does capture an awful lot. But at the ground level, Somebody who checked all those uh, all those boxes may just live their life as a Latino and face all the discrimination that that group mm -hmm. that that group experienced. Right. So, so, right. so what they say right. here uh, uh, is is far different than what life they experience at the at the ground level. Yes. Uh, and I and I wanted to to ask that question first, but make another observation and see what you think about this. Uh, it seems that those that are asking to be considered mixed race, uh, just based on what I saw here. Uh, tend to tend to be privileged people. <laughs> they're coming from college campuses. Uh, they're they're highly intelligent professionals uh, that that are asserting something of a costless identity. Uh, this is a, they're saying, well, you know, I'm I'm a mixed person, and my child, you know, is is part Asian and part white, and I want their identity to to reflect that. And and I don't have anything beyond what you presented. But it just seems to me like a like a very costless thing to assert. Uh, 
Uh, and, and I wonder uh, if it's not so much a tension, as you put at the very end, but simply a, uh, a, a, a far less costly identity as someone today might say, might, uh, might assert uh, if they say they are they're Italian mm -hmm. or, or they're Irish, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. so on St. Patrick's Day they get out the green beer and, and the right. but the rest of the, rest of the year uh, uh, it doesn't really affect their mindset. Right, <laughs> right, right, right. Yeah, um, you know, I think, I think you're raising a lot of, of, of theories uh, that are coming out of sociology. Uh, you know, Mary Waters has a really famous, uh, you know, kind of book on white identification and thinking about Italian identities, right? She you know, argues, right, that this kind of uh, idea of having kind of hyper identification, so kind of having all of these various different choices, uh, really makes identity kind of much more symbolic. It makes that identity much more symbolic, right? When you can kind of choose between all these same things, um, which she argued was very different than, say, identifying as black, right? Which was really not symbolic, but also really not necessarily a lot of choices involved in that. Um, and this was a this is a concern uh, of of uh, civil rights organizations uh, that. Uh, this is really what it, what in fact it is. Uh, civil rights organizations are very, uh, if you ask them to talk about it, they're very careful about, uh, you know, you know, being really uh, uh, open about their support for multiracial identities. They're, they're very hesitant to talk to you about it, uh, mainly because there is a suspicion, right, that, uh, you know, this is uh, really uh, undermining this idea of kind of why do we, Identif why, why is it why is race important right because race is important because we still need to monitor racial discrimination right we need to uh, kind of think about the challenges that are faced by certain groups uh, and if you start thinking about race as identity right that takes that makes it seem like it's it's really about agency right and not really about some of these more systematic institutionalized features of the world right which are related which are related to race so that is in fact you 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 definitely hit it hit a, a very um, a contentious point that a lot of people are saying, which is that they have very a lot of concerns uh, about mixed race. I mean, even when I, I do this presentation, uh, there are folks in the room that that are prepared to argue with me about we shouldn't be we shouldn't even be highlighting multiracial identities because this is undermining the civil rights project, right? Uh, from you know of, of of the second half of the 20th century. Um, uh, so so that is in fact I, I do want to say that that is in fact a, a very predominant argument right now. Um, in terms of, of who multiracial identities are, uh, you were also correct. Uh, um, they are younger, uh, but uh, they are more likely, those who check two boxes, so say white and black, white and black and white and Asian are the two most predominant uh, uh, combinations chosen in the United States. Uh, white and both white and black and white and Asian, uh, their education levels and income levels are very much higher than the minority population. So if you compare right, like the median uh, education of, of Asians and income of Asians uh, alone, white Asian individuals have family, uh, family income and education levels that are higher even than, even than Asians, which is very high. And then, for, and then the same thing goes for white and black, which is that white black individuals have higher education and income levels than black families. Uh, and so we are seeing some attributes of that there is, there are class differences here of who is actually having the opportunity to identify as multiracial. Uh, and it is in some ways, just, uh, there, there are some structural, there are some structural things going on. So yeah, yes, so okay. Just follow up on yeah. that just quickly. I mean, does that suggest that there is a, I mean, picking up on what Ben said at yeah. the beginning, um, that class protects people from the effects of, to some degree, possibly of racial discrimination, racism that makes people like, yeah, I'm clearly black because I'm feeling mm -hmm. the effects of anti-black racism in a way that somebody in a, in a better position mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah won't feel I, the same effects. Yes, I mean, I think this kind of does get into the idea of how um, racialization as non-white is is highly. Uh, um, uh, um, Interactive with how we think about class, right? I mean, this is this is a historic. This is a very historic phenomenon, right? Of kind of associating poor, uh, you know, kind of low SES, uh, low education with non-white populations. I mean, this is there 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 is a very historic correspondence. Uh, yes, with that. Yeah. 
Yeah, no, that's that is very true. Yeah, I mean, I think I think um, you know the. However, I think I, I would challenge you to think about, especially as we're thinking about this as identification. You know, there are various different forces uh, that allow identification to be seen as legitimate or not, right? And so I think when we think about this as identity, you always have to kind of also think about uh, the various different uh, other uh, contexts. Uh, resources, uh, privileges or lack of privileges, right, that inform identity. I think you're right that we, we should not, you know, of course I'm, I'm not coming here uh, talking about this as kind of only a privileged class, you know, I'm thinking about, I'm talking about kind of the importance of, of, of asserting this identity and kind of what it means for us thinking about race. Um, there are, however, there are uh, different narratives, right, that are kind of thinking about um, uh, the, um, Structures and the opportunities that allow for certain identities uh, to be possible or not, which is which is the fact, which is the which is the uh, situation for all all identity groups. You know, not just race. I mean, it's, I mean, if you think about transgender, right? I mean, these are there are uh, open opportunities uh, and privileges that allow for certain types of identities or over not um, as well. Yeah, uh, but it's not necessarily just class. You're right. It's it's various different other things that are are out there. Um, history. Um, kind of re cultural context, et cetera, that offer for opportunities. Um, I think that's that's our that was our last last comment. I have oh. a very simple question. Oh yeah. Yeah. So I'm, I mean, it's just about this. Surf, I mean, the census. Yeah. It's curious to me because I don't remember. Um, is there a similar box for? I mean. It's, in, it's interesting that you can identify as Filipino, Korean, Vietnamese, Japanese, that, the, that they want to know all those things. Yes. But they're not asking, are you Guatemalan, are you, right. are you right. Peruvian? Yes. Are you, I mean, what's the, his, the story behind that? Yeah, so interestingly also, there is no term Asian anywhere uh, on here, right? So the race Asian, uh, I think it's also really interesting that it does not, it no longer exists on the census uh, anymore. Uh, we still think of it as Asian, so when you class, clump them all together, they're going to be Asian. Um, that was actually there were um, uh, there was a uh, Japanese American senator who was on the uh, the committee for the Office of Management and Budget uh, that uh, really uh, lobbied to see greater variation of the Asian community beyond just Asian. He was very successful in. Uh, class then then creating this classification system for Asians that's actually a national origin classification, not a race, not necessarily kind of a conglomerate kind of race classification. Uh, but this is the only group that really gets that, right? You don't get that for black, uh, you don't get it for Latino, uh, you don't get it for any other group. So this is this is a group that it's it's a great example of how different types of individual efforts have gone into the census that have created this these different categories that get to be on race. Uh, uh, kind of as a race question, uh, because uh, those those in many ways are ethnic categories. Yeah, not. Yeah, not and racial obviously categories. Yeah. for blacks, I mean, how many know where they came from, right? As a result right. Yes. Of slavery. Right. 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 Um, yeah. So then the the census actually the federal government actually has combined all of them, but there's actually a lot of interesting data about how people check the multiple boxes even within the Asian category because that's possible right now. Um, so we get probably the most detailed data of Asia, the Asian population, ironically, out of, out of anything. Yeah, uh, because of a relatively powerful 
uh, force that happened yeah, in, the, in the 90s. All right, well, thank you very much. Um, I appreciated uh, all of your comments and, and suggestions. Thank you.